Good morning. This is March 27th in the year 2000 here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is the part of the Morris Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This morning we have with us John Ray. This interview initially took place on November 22nd, 1999. Because of technical difficulties, however, a faulty tape, it was decided to re-interview John for this first of a series of four parts. Good morning, John. Good morning, John. How are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. Do you mind if we ask you your age? No change. 81 years. And what is your current address? Natick. Current marital status? Yes, I'm married. Do you have children, John? I'm father of three children, and my wife is mother of uh, five more. We have eight. We have 14 grandchildren. And we now have, in the current week, the first great-grandchild. Congratulations to you all. <laughs> Where were you born, John? Coronado, California. And raised? Yonkers, New York. I take it you weren't, you didn't grow up in Natick. When, uh, when did you grow, uh, move to Natick? Moved to Natick in 1951, Christmas time of 51. I was under orders at the time for service in Korea. Korean War, and uh, so I came to Natick with my family, Christmas of 51, purchased a house right near where we now are, and uh, left my wife and three children here in Natick while I served in Korea. That didn't last long because when my Korean War service was over, I was moved back to Tokyo, Japan. I was able to call a family forward from Natick to Tokyo, and so actually they resided here for only about nine months at that time. And the house was sold, as my wife put it, I sold everything except the children. And she <laughs> brought them to, to, to Tokyo uh, <clears throat> on uh, leashes and by ship. That was a rather drastic move for a family, wasn't it? What was uh, your family background, John? Well, I was one of five children of my mother and father. Uh, father is a West Point graduate who had intermittent service. He did not have career service in the Army, as I did have later on. And my mother, I'd say her primary duty was wife and mother. Unfortunately, we lost her at a young age. And uh, I'll say more if you wish, whatever you'd like to know. I, I'd like to know, uh, were you inspired to join the service because of your father's career? Well, certainly that had something to do with it. Uh, also, the fact we were living in Yonkers meaning, means we were reasonably close, like 40 miles from West Point, so uh, his own enthusiasm about the finest university in the world uh, probably rubbed off upon me and uh, also my younger brother, Roger. Uh, the, two, uh, the two additional brothers, there were four brothers in all, uh, they went to the Naval Academy. I don't know what it possibly caused that trouble, but uh, uh, they, they did uh, graduate from the Naval Academy. Is that your version of black sheep in the family, John? I don't know exactly where the black sheep is or not. Uh, my father and, and two of his sons were West Point men, and the other two were Naval Academy men. I, no, I don't find the Naval Academy. They have a goat, but no black sheep. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> John, what was your, uh, I take it you went to West Point. That's what, true. What was your educational experience prior to that? Roosevelt High School, Yonkers, New York, plus about uh, half a year at something called Stanton's Prep in Cornwall, New York, which uh, was kind of a cram school to pass the entrance exams at West Point. Would you tell us about that, your appointment and uh, taking an exam for the point? Uh, I had a congressional appointment to West Point. I'm not sure I got the rest of the question. Um, from who gave you your appointment to West Point? 
Christopher Sullivan, Congressman Tammany Hall, New York. He gave it to this Republican uh, youngster. And can you tell us about taking the exams for the West Point? What was involved there? Special exams that you had prepared you for? for entry? Yes, sir. Well, first I'd like to say I'm not quite sure that it's exactly the same today as it was 64 years ago. I'm not sure about that. I can tell you what it was in my time. It was a relatively simple requirement, which was uh, uh, examinations in English, algebra, geometry, and history. These were the subjects which were examined by civil service examinations given on behalf of the congressman to whom you had applied for appointment. He would, give the, he would have the exam given to all of the applicants, and presumably those who came out highest got the appointment, assuming that they also passed physical exam and so forth. Mm -hmm. When did you join the military, John? I was a cadet from 1935 to 39. Can you tell us a little bit about your life uh, as a cadet? And being at West Point? It was marvelous. Uh, what, what shall I say? The, I think there's a very well-rounded, again, I'm speaking of 60 years ago, and things have changed since. I know more about it either 60 years ago or maybe 50 years ago when I was an instructor there, but I'm not really up to date on how it is now. Every cadet in my time took exactly the same identical curriculum. This is hard for people to imagine, even for those of us who did it, I guess. At age, I was 17 years and two months when I became a cadet. Some of my classmates were as old as nearly 22. Some of them actually were college graduates before they were a cadet. Others maybe were halfway through college before they were a cadet. Nevertheless, we all took the identical curriculum. Uh, I did not at the time find that in any sense objectionable, and I may not even today. But uh, in, in any event, it has changed a lot today, such that nowadays a cadet can even take pre-medical and, uh, and graduate from West Point and become, uh, uh, and go to medical school and in due course, three or four years later, become a, a doctor in the U.S. Army. But that's really not what you're asking me. What, what else about the academy? The big thing is environment and spirit and physical fitness and mental fitness and emotional fitness. It is the most rounded uh, educational experience I know of in this world. Perhaps that's why I feel it's the best. If I do my math correctly, John, if you entered in 35 and came out in 39, uh, uh -huh. 39 was the beginning of the war in Europe. Did, did your class graduate just to confront a world war? Well, you can hardly believe, John, how, how close you are to perfection about that question. We graduated on June 12, 39. We had 90 days vacation before going to work. That put us to duty on September 12. Check your history book and you'll see the same week as when Hitler attacked Poland. So he waited for you to get out of that <laughs> That's school. what it seems like. <laughs> seems like. Perhaps one of the worst mistakes he ever made was to wait for the class of 39. What was your first assignment, John? We were all second lieutenants of field artillery. We were commissioned by the hand of Franklin Roosevelt. By golly, he presented our diploma and our commission to us in June. My first assignment was to the 6th Field Artillery, horse-drawn, in Fort Hoyle, Maryland. This was an ancient regiment, going back to Alexander Hamilton's time, historically speaking, and employing the weapon, which was a 75 millimeter gun, <coughs> model 1897. Even then, 1897 seemed a long way back. So those weapons were of a model which was, uh, what, uh, more than 40 years old at the time that, uh, that I went to duty. Uh, those weapons uh, had been used in War I 
Fortunately, they were re retired during the period of uh, uh, very soon after uh, 39 when uh, we were commissioned. Uh, so that weapon did not really serve in War II. It was replaced by newer things that had been developed during the 1930s, we'll say, by the uh, U.S. Army Ordnance. Did I understand you to say that your entire class went into the artillery service? Excuse me, I didn't get it. Did your entire graduating class uh, go, go into the artillery? Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. No, the class, and the same today, I think, as it was then, the class is divided among all the branches of the Army. In those days, uh, it was pretty much all the combat branches of the Army. Today, it's somewhat different in that respect. But um, in other words, the, the Army required combat officers in infantry, artillery, coast artillery, Corps of Engineers, cavalry. I've named five branches, uh, and it may have been six or seven, actually. And they were divided up. We graduated with 456 cadets. And the various uh, arms that I have just mentioned placed their demands upon the academy in accordance with the relative strength, authorized strengths, of those different branches. Am I coming through all right on that? Yes. Did yeah. you volunteer for the artillery? That's it, exactly. They, the, uh, each man is volunteers for the branch that he chooses. The only thing is if, let's say that the engineer corps was allowed 20 uh, graduates in my year, and uh, if those 20 had all been uh, picked up by the higher, higher ranking graduates, higher academic ranking, then engineer would not be available for the lower ranking cadet graduates. Does that come through all right? Yes. So uh, typically, uh, all through the years of the 20s and the 30s, infantry was always the last to be drawn. And so the bottom of the class was entirely in the infantry. That's probably why the infantry is so successful. And it has uh, uh, competent men who maybe are not involved too much with slide rules and Chaucer, but rather they have some tactical uh, uh, competence. That's certainly one way to look at it. <laughs> John, did anybody else join uh, West Point with you uh, from your area that w with remained friends with you during your career? I see. You mean uh, like high school? Yeah. Classmates and all like that. I'd say that there were none that I knew before I was a cadet except that at that little prep school I mentioned, we were all from all over the country. We were all uh, uh, seeking admission to the military academy. And so I, I, I was friendly with whatever, 20 or 30 boys who were accepted mm -hmm. from that prep school, but appointed from different districts all over the country. Mm -hmm. So you began to make lifelong friends at that early time? Oh, that's time. absolutely true. Those 456 men who graduated with me, mind you, we had begun with 756 when we entered. We graduated 456. And those men, uh, those 456, every one I knew by his first name, every one I considered to be my friend, and of those who are still around now, we have a pretty good uh, relationship 65 years later than our entry. Well, I'm in fairly close contact uh, uh, with a good many of those all my life. That must be very rewarding for you. Very much so. Can you tell us about uh, your duties at your first uh, post? It was great. This was horse-drawn artillery. And of course, uh, one course we took as cadets was equitation, meaning horseback riding and uh, horse care and uh, the feeding and medical care of horses. All those were in the cadet curriculum in relatively minor degree. And uh, uh, I chose horse-drawn. I had the opportunity to choose horse-drawn voluntarily. I wanted that, and it, it really was uh, marvelous. Uh, I learned at that time, and I criticized the Army, actually, uh, today for changing it. 
I believe that about the best leadership training I can think of for very young new soldiers and officers is if they can learn to command a horse, they can later learn to command a regiment. And it's a <laughs> good place to begin with leadership. And regrettably, the horse has been taken out of our army for 50 years ago. I suppose I can quit regretting it one of these days, probably uh, that way to stay. But I think the horse is great, and that's why I chose horse drawn. But that's only part of it. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to play polo in the Army, and have a, a real fine time, an expanded social life. This was all in Maryland. The girls in Maryland are beautiful, and the horses are beautiful, and the season is beautiful. So Maryland, my Maryland, you know, was uh, pretty good uh, in those days. Uh, we worked pretty hard, uh, I suppose. The main thing was learning our business, learning to be an officer of the Army, learning to care about leadership, learning to care for our men and care for our horses. And those, I think, were our principal responsibilities in those earliest commissioned days. It was an extension, if you will, of being a cadet. Uh, all those things are emphasized at West Point as well. Leadership was the big thing to learn. Well, as 39, 1939 moved along and Hitler moved across Europe, it quickly became evident to the people in Washington uh, <coughs> that we had to build an army. The U.S. Army, as of 1939, was a paltry little organization. It, it was nothing. My father told me that the officer corps of the U.S. Army is smaller than the New York Police Force. That's what he told me at the time. And we had to build that army, you understand. Uh, as soon as the, uh, uh, the uh, dangers in the world started to become evident uh, to the president and to uh, the, the uh, authorities in Washington, it was clear that that paltry army had to be completely overhauled. John, and this was what was done. Uh, a new word was introduced into your language during those years. It was blitzkrieg. How did you adapt to what Hitler was doing in Europe? I first want to say that in that year of 1939-40, I'm astonished today how unaware we were of what was going on in Europe. By we, I mean the whole American public, mm -hmm. not just the six field artillery. I, I think there was an unawareness that today astonishes me. But Within a year after our commission, we were commissioned, my six field artillery was broken up in its pieces and uh, we were all astonished by the changes made uh, uh, before the war had become any sort of a reality to us. They busted up and abolished the horse drawn, made it motorized. Uh, it meant we had to learn everything that there was to know about trucks instead of about horses. How to maintain and care for those trucks. How to march the uh, hundreds or perhaps thousands even of trucks and tanks and so forth in convoy across uh, the country and to have a, a march discipline, we called it. All this had to be developed by us young officers under the tutorship, the leadership of our uh, older superiors. But the young men from classes like 38 and 39 and 40 and 41 and so forth, all those classes of graduates, and of course many of uh, other very fine officers who were not West Point graduates, had to learn to create this army, John, from, John, which was almost nothing. It sounds almost as though you were doing this in a vacuum with no reference to what was happening in Europe. Is that true? I could say for the first year that what you've said is pretty true for 1939 and 40. But once 40, uh, once we got into 1940, I'm telling you, our country was aware even before Pearl Harbor, uh, I believe, and our army was aware that we were in bad shape, mm -hmm. that we had nothing, and we had to create this thing. The Jeep, for example, had not been developed and invented. I remember the first Jeep I ever saw. Astonishing to see. This was to replace the horse. This is what the whole business was all about. Mm -hmm. Our radios, we didn't have any generators to, to uh, generate uh, uh, the electric power for radios and telephones. You, you did a grinding thing like this to create the electricity needed to do ra radio operation. 
also important communication is to our army. And all these things had to be developed in the factories as well as in the field here. What America did for itself in the period 1939, I'll say till 42 or 43, is almost beyond imagination. And this Republican has the hugest admiration for Democrat Franklin D. Roosevelt for his leadership in developing the whole American economy to do uh, what was necessary to, port, to support us and the uh, entire uh, forces of America. How long did you stay at your first assignment? Slightly under one year. And this brought you up to 1940-something? Right. 1940. I was immediately sent from Fort Hoyle to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the home of the artillery school, there to learn communications. Others of my classmates were sent there to learn about vehicle maintenance, to learn about other things which were, in a sense, almost new to the Army. That's exaggerating a bit. But uh, it, it was new to most of us. We knew more about horses than we did about trucks. Maybe that's a way that we can understand that. We knew more about a, a, a grinder kind of a generator to produce the electricity for the radios uh, than we did about the Morse code. So you I, were a very transitional area in the United States. Oh, Army. yes. Yeah. How long were you at Fort Sill? Fort Sill, a few months, about four months. I came back and I found that uh, the six field artillery had been abolished. And I was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia to the uh, to the 4th Infantry Division, which we were there creating from scratch. We were building this from nothing. And I'm telling you, we did a great job with that. This was a motorized division. The Army had never had such a thing before. We learned how it is to be able to uh, march the uh, motorized formation 150 miles a day, uh, cook the food necessary for the men in the mess truck, which we devised the mess truck, a rolling kitchen, if you will. All of this, men like myself and like the mess sergeants and all the different fine people that were involved in this, I'm, we're, I'm telling you, they were building an army from nothing. Where did the men come from? Was the draft in effect at this time? The draft, if I'm not mistaken, was first about November of 40, 1940. When I went to that 4th Infantry Division at approximately that date, we had only the cadre for the different units involved in making a division. So you lacked a lot of men. Let's say that a, that a company of infantry or a battery of artillery will say was approximately 150 men. You had a, had a cadre of probably about 15 non-commissioned officers, sergeants and corporals, and one or two officers for this company. And everything else was a vacancy, like you, had, you were short 135 men. And these men were drafted or recruited. I won't remember every detail. I need a few more minutes to do that, but <clears throat> these men were drafted and recruited. They might have come right out of Harvard or Tufts or Boston University on the one hand, or they might have, have come out of the Tennessee mountains on the other hand. And uh, <clears throat> some were drafted and some were, uh, were volunteers, no doubt. And we had to take those newly drafted, newly trained recruits. They had been to basic training for eight weeks. They came to us in huge blocks, like 10,000 men came to the 4th Infantry Division. This is at the end of 1940. Who was running the United States Army in those days? George Catmont Marshall was the chief of staff. Probably the, if there's any finer general in the history of America, I cannot imagine who that would be. He's a VMI graduate, not a West Point graduate. He's a, a contemporary of Douglas MacArthur, just to get the timing on such a man. Meaning that he graduated VMI, I believe, in 1904. And here, here was a man that contributed hugely to the success of our forces. I think his greatest significant specific contribution was the selection of all of the generals that, that it took to run our <coughs> whole army and air force. I attribute this to George Catlett March. What other names can you tell us of men that were putting together this army that names would be familiar to us today? You know, he so dominates the whole thing in my memory that I, that question may be a little tough. But 
if, if I go down two men younger than Marshall by, say, 12 or 15 years, then I get into the Eisenhower and Bradley and so forth era. If I go about, say, seven or eight years younger than Marshall, I get to the George Patton uh, era. Patton was older by a few years than uh, Bradley and uh, Eisenhower. Uh, but I don't like to stop it there, you know, like there'd be two East spots in the Air Force and uh, numerous uh, names, and I wouldn't do want to leave the Naval Academy out of this, including, let's say, Admiral McCain, just no, for fun. but at this point in time, who were the, the really big players in putting together the army that you uh, thrived in after, after the United States entered the war? Isn't that interesting? I, I'm taking your question to mean between 1940 and about maybe 43, before the war is really uh, full blown. We didn't get off the ground till about 43, that's correct. 42. Yeah. We were fighting in North Africa in 42. Yes, sir. I was there, so, so were these other guys. Um, but in all truth, the number of well-known leaders in that period, 39, 42, I'll have to scratch my brain a little. I can do it and I'll come out with them, but uh, uh, well, I don't want, uh, I don't there's want kind to, of a, there's kind of a transition here. between that date and the time when the force is now a reality in, say, 43. And by that time, George Marshall, I credit him with, will have selected who are the generals from, from our numbers who are going to run this whole show. And this is what I give him the huge credit for. I've named a couple of them, and I can go lots further with lots more of them. But it's kind of that he kind of gave birth to them, I feel. Don't mistake me, they were hardworking officers uh, ever from War I on up into War II, and he knew who they were. They were not known to the public prior to that time. They became well known uh, during the various campaigns. We could go over many different names. I can no, tell we, you. We most won't have time for yeah. that, but uh, can you tell us what you did then in 1941? 41. I was designated to command Headquarters Battery, 4th Division Artillery. I was a, I was a 23-year-old first lieutenant. I was given command of a Headquarters Battery, <coughs> uh, which emphasizes communication and uh, uh, um, intelligence and. Uh, dare I say, the non-combative support of the, uh, of the artillery pieces that fire within the division artillery. And uh, my principal job was to, you might say, was to organize these recruits, newly from the Tennessee mountains or from Harvard College, organize these into a battery and uh, train them in their specific MOSs, means military occupation spe specialty, uh, create a mess hall, a motor pool, and all these different things. There are a lot of things that we may not think about so often in, the, uh, uh, in a small unit and make the whole thing a cohesive outfit. My little headquarters battery was uh, so wonderful that we won almost every prize in the fourth division. We were the baseball champs. We were the low venereal rate champs. We were the low absence rate champs. We were, we were everything. We were the finest little battery. There were about, uh, what would be the B would be about uh, 50 companies and batteries in a division. And we, we had more prizes for number one than you can imagine. Partly because I had been given first choice of the men. And I filled this battery with, I'm telling you, Princeton and Harvard and Yale and every, all these great uh, Ivy League outfits constituted my men. We could do anything until George Marshall put out an order in which he created, created officer candidate schools. First time we'd had them uh, since War I. I don't know much about that in War I, but these were created right then and there. And as he created the officer candidate school for our army, General Marshall sent this advice to every single officer of the total army. You must not stand in the way of an enlisted man going to officer candidate school. If I find any commander 
standing in the way, keeping competent young enlisted men from going to officer candidate school, I will punish the officer responsible for doing that. I will relieve him of his command, said George Marshall. So what happened to John Ray's headquarters battery? All my Harvard and Princeton and Yale and so forth, Duke University and University of Indiana or whatever, all these guys that I had in there, zingo, they all went off to officer candidate school. And John was left with a few Tennessee boys without much education. And from them, he built a battery that would stick and would not go to officer candidate school. Just John, a kind John. of a, a real happy memory of the brilliance of uh, George Marshall. Who democratized the army in that sense. Right. Let me ask you uh, where, what other places you served in in 1941. Uh, well, I didn't get it. What other bases did you serve on in 1941? Did you stay at Fort Benning? Stayed at Fort Benning until we activated Camp Gordon at Augusta, Georgia, a new base. And we moved the whole 4th Division, about 15,000 men, from Benning up to, uh, to Fort Gordon simply a short change of station. And we went to, a, instead of an old established post, now we had to create a base as well. But I stayed there only for a little while because in May of 1942, my commanding general of the division, Major General Lloyd R. Friedendahl, was transferred from division headquarters to command the Second Army Corps. You skipped over a pretty important date. Where were you on December 7th, 1941? Fort Benning, Georgia. Where did you get the news of Pearl Harbor? In the barracks of Fort Benning, Georgia. And what was your reaction? Uh, life is going to change. I don't know how, but it's going to change. How did your life change? Well, I've kind of been getting into some of this already. Uh, but uh, huh, that's interesting. I had had a note from my younger brother, Alan Ray, out in the Pacific while we're on maneuvers, while I was on maneuvers with the 4th Division in the Louisiana maneuvers of 1941. I got a letter from my kid brother who was an ensign in the Navy aboard the USS uh, Lexington, the old Lex it was called. I got a little note in which he said, you know, people back home don't know it, but we've got a war about to happen in the Pacific. This is dated about November 7, I'll say, 1941. And the writer was 21 years old. He said, there's about to be a war out here. You better let them know at home. And a month later, he was proven right. A month later, right. You just spoke about a date in 1942 now, in May. In May of 42, my division commander was promoted to command 2nd U.S. Army Corps headquarters at Jacksonville, Florida. And surprisingly to me, he called upon me to move with him to this new assignment. And it's, so I was stripped out of the 4th Infantry Division and moved to Roman II U.S. Army Corps at Jacksonville. This corps had already been alerted, corps headquarters, you understand, headquarters only, had been alerted to get to England promptly, within a month. We got there, I think, about July 10. To England? And our, of 1942. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Friedendahl had taken me for whatever reason, I probably, dare I say, maybe he felt I was uh, 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 something worth having, and uh, he probably didn't know what he was going to do with me, but uh, in any event, he needed uh, other young people like myself. He, he stripped a few of us out of the units, and uh, uh, we became his headquarters. All of us untrained in anything to do with relatively high command staff work. John, you were four months away from the invasion of Africa. Uh, when did you get, first get an inkling you were in for a big, Wonderful. big uh, move. The, the, uh, we had gone to Tidworth, England. That's a, a training uh, area for the British Army. And General Friedendahl and his staff were uh, called to send a cadre of that staff to London uh, to prepare for action. And I was one of those who was sent. I felt like a very immature person. Uh, I didn't know anything about high-level Army command, anything about it no experience uh, uh, at all. And uh, I learned after three or four days of being in London, uh, through some, somebody's probably error, that 
we were going to go to Oran you know, uh, for our first combat against Hitler. And believe it, John, I went up and down the shore, the, the coast of France with a map looking for Oran, where can it be on the coast of France? And it wasn't there. <laughs> it's moved. <laughs> and it, I discovered that it was in Algeria. Yes. I knew nothing. And the other thing I knew nothing about was my new assignment. It had been discovered that ammunition would be required to fight a war. Really? I'm teasing a bit, but that's the way it seemed like it to me. <clears throat> we never had any before during the training days because the Army was out of ammunition. Now we knew ammunition would be required for war, and you had to have somebody to run the am ammunition uh, business for General Friedendahl, and I was selected to do that, to take that job. Uh, some could say it's a natural for an artilleryman 24 years old. That's okay. Turned out it was. But uh, uh, it, it's not what artillery is. I wasn't shooting anything. I was really in a logis logistics and kind of warehousing and transportation and shipping business uh, for the uh, 160 different uh, items of uh, ammunition that it takes to fight a war in 1942. Today, of course, it might be thousands instead of a couple of hundred items. It became my job to uh, arrange for all this. And things don't just happen, you know. When these uh, big wars or little wars come by, uh, we don't give very much attention, in the press at least, to logistics and such as that. Such as that. But they don't happen on their own. And it was my job, along with uh, lots of other very uh, skillful and talented people, don't mistake me, to uh, uh, create the whole matter of the uh, ammunition logistics for North Africa. How did you know, let me phrase this as best I can, how did you know how much to get? How big is the war going to be? Uh, yeah, well, now that's, the, the question is fun, really, for me. Um, I was told by my superiors uh, in the uh, ammunition in the ordnance business, uh, what to read in terms of field manuals and such, uh, to learn answers to such certain questions. And the answers would appear in a form like this, that uh, for each uh, uh, howitzer in the war, you should have 30 rounds per day. Or maybe it said 60, or maybe it said 300, or maybe it said whatever it said. Uh, but I, I soon realized that this kind of guidance was really relatively meanly, meaningless. I made that decision within myself. How did that, you come to that conclusion? <laughs> because when you, uh, uh, I guess I came to that conclusion in part by rubbing shoulders with, we call them the Brits, my experienced British comrades who were in England, who were doing similar staff duty for their work. A lot of stuff comes by osmosis. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of learn that. Uh, and uh, how do you figure these questions out? And you know, uh, just give one other particular example. Let's say for the 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, uh, which can fire, could fire, at the rate of maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 rounds per minute. And somebody would say, well, so how much do you need for a day? And all of a sudden, the figures would become so astronomical that you would become uh, uh, like flooded with this anti-aircraft uh, munitions if you followed uh, some of these rules. So I just determined on my own, own part, but don't mistake me, with the approval of, the, of my superiors, I did have superiors, some people doubted that, I guess, at times. But uh, I would uh, get their approval for what I did. And we simply rewrote the entire uh, whole theory of ammunition supply before we ever went to war. That in four months, then, you had to buy, uh, procure all this ammunition that's and make true. the formulas for how much. Uh, that's and the invasion was on November 8th of 42, I believe. Uh, and you were ready. Please don't mistake me about this, John. The Services of Supply, SOS, had been in England ahead of us. And they had 
begun the gathering of huge quantities of munitions and blankets and hospital tents and food and all the rest of it. I'm not saying they were not, that they were uh, lazy or anything. They were doing this. Uh, and a lot of stuff had been uh, sequestered in England uh, for use there. Please don't mistake me about that. And back in the States under the leadership of General George Marshall, the factories and all had been uh, set into operation producing all this stuff. Even if, dare I say, nobody really knew how much you needed to, would be needed, they knew at the factory level that lots of it would be needed. I wonder if I'm ducking the question. No, uh, that, not really. So the, the, all these different supplies were in the pipeline, as we called it, but it was a matter of getting it sorted out and when it had to be moved from England to North Africa. Now you've got to be very careful because shipping will be of very uh, great significance that, that we have enough ships to do the job and we cannot send garbage that's not needed. We have to be able to send an intelligent amount of stuff. It's a very interesting and exciting, if not glamorous, subject to put all this stuff together. How did you compete for shipping space? with all the other things that were being sent over. Very interesting point, very interesting point. In other words, how did we decide how much shipping goes to blankets or hospitals or uh, 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 replacement truck tires or to tank treads and all of these stuff versus ammunition? Am I with you on what the yes, question sir. is? Exactly. And so we had what, uh, we put together kind of an ad hoc committee representatives from each of these interests, if you will. The different branches of our army, the Transportation Corps, the Quartermaster Corps, the Ordnance Corps, the Signal Corps, are all in the supply business uh, in order to support the infantry, the artillery, the tanks, but and the cavalry. But who set the priorities? So, a little committee, kind of, was established, we didn't even, we hadn't invented the word committee by that time. <laughs> if we, it's maybe too task, bad you did. <laughs> maybe task force or something. We were put together to uh, make all this, to make all this stuff match up. And it's, a, it's really a very exciting kind of a study to fit all this together. If we had lots more time, I'm sure I could tell some interesting stories about this, but I, I, I doubt we would have the time to do it. How, how you must balance out the food against the blankets, against the uh, fuel, uh, petroleum, and uh, the medical supplies, all this must be nicely balanced. And we would meet <coughs> darn near every day of my war for the next three and a half years with the necessary people, uh, not necessarily a person being actually present, but each of these subjects being considered every single day to be sure that everything is in appropriate balance and stuff doesn't run out. Of course, everything doesn't turn out perfect, and as we know later on, like in Bulge Battle and all that, uh, years later, uh, things did run out. Where were you on November 8th, 1942? November 8, 1944, I landed at uh, Oran, 42. Uh, North Africa, 1942, yes, 42. November 8, 1942 was the first United States Army ground force operation in the whole, uh, uh, what do we say, Western uh, Hemisphere. That is in North Africa. You went to Algeria. Oran? Uh, Oran, Algeria, yes. Yep. We had gone by ship from England through the Straits of Gibraltar. All the force went in by ship through the Straits of Gibraltar, and we landed on the 8th of November. That was D-Day of 1942. On the very same day, General Patton and uh, his task force at, landed at Casablanca uh, on the very same the day Atlantic and hour, side. I guess. And meanwhile, General Montgomery and uh, uh, Alexander uh, landed at uh, uh, Algiers, vicinity of Algiers. There were three landings on the 8th of November. And what was your immediate responsibility upon landing? My immediate there? responsibility was to feed the ammunition to the troops where it was needed. By what process? Uh, it, it was being delivered at three different <coughs> points? It came, 
My responsibility was solely at Oran, don't mistake me. Oran uh, from uh, Casablanca is probably three or 400 miles, and Algeria, these were three separate operations. Okay. Oran was my business, and it was General Friedendahl's business, Second Corps. And he had ass assigned to his corps the 1st Infantry Division, and the I uh, should know the rest of the principal forces, I think 9th Infantry Division, and uh, his own headquarters, and then all the artillery support and other stuff needed to make the Corps go. And what, uh, what was the objective? What were, what were you to capture? What was your military objective? My military? Objective. Objective. Was to make a was pretty much the same for all three of these forces, to make a lodgment uh, on North Africa in order that we could then move east up toward Tunisia and close the pincher against Rommel's German force, which by then was retreating from Montgomery at El Alamein. So Montgomery was pushing them west, and you hoped to push them east and catch that, them in the middle. That's exactly right. Now, they were not there to be pushed, mind you, until we got up into Tunisia. Mm -hmm. As we landed in Algeria, the main thing was get a lodgment, a place from which we can move along. So our immediate uh, uh, enemy uh, on shore at, uh, whether we speak of Algiers, Oran, or Casablanca, the immediate enemy uh, was not really uh, a huge force. It was a conglomerate force of various uh, bits and pieces of things, uh, including even the French Foreign Legion. One of the first officers I met among the enemy was the French Foreign Legion. But the, the operation, you know, I don't like to underplay it at Oran because it was very important. On the other hand, it was not a huge operation. Some of my own classmates were killed there. Uh, it's important that, uh, you know, their service be recognized as well. But we were not a substantial force until we moved on up a distance of about 300 miles up to Tunisia, which occurred about the 1st of December. We began that movement. Having made the safe lodgment, we then moved uh, east. All right, uh, let's, let's stop a second. You were, you were part of a major invasion, uh, which met resistance from the French, among others. Can you tell us about your, your feelings on that day? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I don't know there's a whole lot to tell, except it's, uh, it was a great relief when I found that, uh, along with my other young friends, well, here we are. We're in Africa, can you imagine that? You wouldn't have guessed that a month or two ago. Here we are in Africa, and uh, things are uh, relatively quiet. We have our safe lodgment. There seems to be little uh, uh, combat going on in the vicinity. Uh, so I don't know, we were, we were such young kids. It's hard to uh, convey, really, for me today, how sort of uh, carefree and all that uh, I, I think a good many of us were. I don't want to downplay the importance of my infantry friends, mind you, who some of them gave their lives on that beach. Mm -hmm. Don't mistake me. But the, from the overall point of view, well, here we are. What's going to happen next? And we did not know at that time. I didn't know that next we're going to Tunisia. You know, uh, confidentiality and secrecy is a very important thing. You know that in warfare. <coughs> And you tell only that which people need to know, and I didn't need to know that, so I did not know it. I was not informed. It may seem hard to imagine, but it's very true. I was not informed that Tunisia was the next stop. So and all, you, you all, were caught up in the big movement of three separate landings to move east against the Germans. How far? How did you move? Did, did you get in one of those new jeeps? Uh, how did you move across the countryside to get up to Tunisia? A couple yes. hundred miles. <clears throat> By this time, mind you, uh, we have quite a considerable amount of uh, 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 truck 
transportation, and each uh, division had its own uh, uh, vehicles and all required. I'm not mentioning armored division right now. I c uh, could, but just to limit the thing a little bit, uh, w we had uh, trucks either assigned to the division or from transportation units that could move the troops up there. <coughs> it would not be reasonable to think of the troops even in that day marching on foot from Oran to Tunis, no way, That's, uh, that would be too much. Put it on your calendar and you'd see we'd never get there. We went by truck, but <clears throat> we also must always use the most important means of transportation of all, which is, even today in my opinion, is still trains for moving freight, moving personnel also, but mostly for moving freight. And I found myself, the minute that the Oran invasion was a, a success and it was time to move to Tunisia, probably late in November, Thanksgiving Day maybe, 1st of December, uh, we made clear that we were moving the Corps to Tunisia. And I was thereupon uh, temporarily relieved of my munitions responsibilities and I was placed in charge of the uh, Chemin de Fer Algerien, that's the Algerian Railroad, uh, to run supplies, uh, mostly supply freight, including ammunition, from the Oran area on up to Tunis. This gave me an excellent... Were you headed specifically for the city of Tunis? Uh, no, I shouldn't have said that. I should yeah. have said the uh, country of Tunisia. No, Tunis was our eventual goal, that city mm -hmm. of Tunis. But no, Tunis was in Rommel's hands at that time. We were headed for places like... Oh, boy. Uh, Tebessa and Constantine in Tunisia. Constantine, really? And later on, pardon? That's a fascinating city. I'm, I'm pleased uh, to know you've oh been yes. there. Yeah, uh, Constantine, Tebessa, Gafsa, Sebetla, uh, on and on, uh, little places that people don't even know about, Mature. Those were the Tunisian towns that we would be getting into. Okay, now Rommel is in Tunis, where it has come that far west. And you're coming the other way. The I say he controlled Tunis. All right. Where His was forces were still uh, east of Tunis, uh, in between uh, uh, Libya and Tunisia. Mm -hmm. That's where the war was then being fought. And our two corps was to go up there and, let's say, to become the, uh, uh, the anvil against which Montgomery would strike and destroy Rommel. All right. Let me name a place. Let me name the Kasserine Pass. Yes. Had, when did that develop? Now we move up to Washington's birthday, February 22nd, right. 1943. Tell us what happened there. Now, <coughs> would you like a drink? Winston John? Churchill was quoted at the time uh, saying, Never have so few been commanded from so far by so many. That was Churchill's summary of our situation. We were a, a paltry little army. We were, a, we were actually the Roman two corps, second to none, the wide world or. And we consisted of about two and a half divisions plus the various supporting elements. We were neither experienced nor are we sufficient in our numbers. Uh, very inexperienced must be emphasized. Our men at all levels, including myself and everybody else, up and down, we were all ex inexperienced in what we were doing. And at the other end of our side was uh, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery and his Eighth Army, which was chasing Rommel across the uh, deserts and across toward Tunisia, and, and Montgomery's force was an experienced force. We were inexperienced, and of course Rommel also was an experienced force, so there we are. He pushed them against an anvil that really was not solid. It wasn't competent to deal with this whole thing. Churchill knew that, Eisenhower knew that, everybody knew that we were inexperienced, and also that we probably were under-equipped, that there are that our equipment was uh, uh, not yet fully proved. Much of it had been developed or invented, we'll 
might be saying, uh, during recent years and not yet, not yet combat tested. This had to be done and all this was done. And we suffered a severe punishment at Catherine Path for reasons that are at least suggested in what I've said. Catherine Pass is a place about central in Tunisia, I would say, and there Rommel's forces being uh, moved by Montgomery's forces toward us found that we were soft stuff. We were not fully competent and surely not enough of us. Maybe we should have had about uh, eight or ten divisions instead of two and a half divisions to be doing that job. We were very badly punished and the 1st Armored Division was badly hurt in there and the 1st Infantry Division was uh, not quite that badly hurt, 34th Infantry Division, all these fine forces, uh, you might say they had to fight in the, uh, in the uh, uh, major leagues before they had had much minor league warm-up. How about yourself, John? Uh, when and where did you come in contact with the enemy? Uh, well, I, I think I know what, you, what you're really asking. I want you to understand that my ammunition troops, my men who supply ammunition to all these forces, these are what my concern is. Mm -hmm. And in the sense that ammunition companies presumably don't ever fight against the enemy, I could answer sort of like never. Uh, on the other hand, they certainly are influencing the enemy by providing this stuff to the various forces, infantry, armor, artillery, and so forth. They're, and we had begun that contact November 8th. Now it continues much more intensely in providing our stuff for the artillery to fire at the Germans uh, in Catherine pastime. But I know what you're really leading to is uh, 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 when did I come first face to face with German infantry? Is that what you're asking? That's my question. <laughs> and that happened in uh, March of 1943. Uh, more or less a month after Catherine Pass, maybe three weeks after Catherine Pass, at which time, uh, possibly through my own ignorance or folly or just bad luck, I was captured by the Germans at a town of Matur in northern Tunisia, uh, not so far west of Tunis. Please tell us about that. <coughs> General Friedendahl had been removed for command of two corps at Catherine Pass. Evidently for incompetence, God bless his soul. Uh, I don't want to leave any bad thoughts there. Uh, I think he got a real tough deal because he was given an almost impossible task mm -hmm. that he didn't do uh, successfully. And that's where the fault for Catherine Pass is sometimes assigned, not by me, but some people assign it that way. He was succeeded by George Patton, who succeeded, uh, Patton succeeded in completely reversing the whole uh, direction of um, American uh, leadership and uh, building from this scrap heap little army, which Second Army Corps was, building it into a real fighting force. And here I give great tribute and honor to George Patton for being able, largely through, through his own wisdom and personality and so many fine qualities that he made from nearly nothing a winning force which was able to do a great thing to defeat Rommel immediately after Catherine Pass. Tell us about your being captured, John. General Patton soon was relieved of command and replaced by Omar Bradley. Uh, this for reasons favorable to Patton. I won't get into it further. Omar Bradley became our commander in uh, approximately uh, about maybe March 10 of 1943. And General Bradley instructed me as follows. He said, the Brits want to capture Tunis all by themselves. They think they can do it without the American forces. And I have told Field Marshal Alexander, that is not a satisfactory to the American people. 
the Americans need a victory, and we propose to participate in the victory against Rommel, said Omar Bradley. I'm quoting him from himself. And he demanded, therefore, that our forces, two corps, would fight beside uh, Montgomery's forces to defeat Rommel at Tunis. And uh, Field Marshal Alexander and Montgomery had questioned the ability of the American forces to be able, able to position themselves up to the north. We've been fighting toward the south to move this whole force in a fish hook kind of direction to face around toward Tunis and participate successfully and meaningfully in that battle. I don't want it to sound political or small time. I, I feel hurried in trying to say it. I got to do it. And so Bradley said to me after he had arranged that with Alexander, Alexander had said, if you can get your forces there, they may fight or words to that effect. This doesn't sound too good, I don't think, the way I'm saying this. And in any event, Brad said, can we do it, John? Have you got the munitions to do the job? I said, sir, when do we attack? He said, we have five days. I said, we can do it, sir. Tell him we'll attack, which General Bradley did. And in, I spent the next five days uh, moving the complete impetus of the supplies uh, from a southward direction on up about 150 or more miles in a northeasterly direction toward Tunis so as to be able to support the forces. Please don't let me leave you any idea that the ammunition officer is the big thing. We're also moving uh, all the troops concerned. Uh, three or four American divisions are moving up there. An amazing accomplishment. I recall meeting a British officer on the side of the road, and he said, uh, what is going on here? And I said, well, we're just moving the Second Corps up to uh, attack Tunis. And this man says, the British officer says, you Brits, you, you, you Americans, you don't understand. We have movement control, he said. Uh, you Americans look as though you're all movement and no control. I said, you've got it, brother. That's us. John, well, we, we have you want to get me captured. John, and, we have half an hour left on this tape. Uh -huh. So it's important that we get to Sicily. Uh -huh. Tell us about your capture, and I, I know that has a happy ending to it. Uh-huh. All right. Are we going ahead? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I told General Bradley we could support the operation. I did not hear from General Bradley or his uh, subordinates uh, for the next five days until I telephoned him where I knew him to be at his headquarters, and he said, how'd we do, John? And I said, the job is done, sir. We have everything required for the job. Uh, and General Bradley said, I knew it would be that way. He said, therefore, I'd launched the attack three hours ago. This I mentioned to demonstrate the huge confidence that this distinguished officer placed in this little unknown person at the time. And this is so important. This comes from West Point experience and other, and I leave it as my great, con my great uh, uh, commendation to my l late most wonderful commander of the whole war, Omar Nelson Bradley. <clears throat> Soon as I re made that report to me, he told me to take two or three days off to rest. And I made the mistake of uh, heading up toward the Mediterranean for a swim uh, in the Mediterranean uh, during these uh, three days that he would not need me. And within a matter of an hour or two of uh, that time, and before I ever got the swim, I was captured by the German infantry uh, in the vicinity of Mature, west of Tunis. <coughs> the captivity business is a story in itself, which I believe uh, needn't be given uh, very much attention. I'll pick out a highlight or two and mention those. Obviously, it's not uh, a happy kind of life, but there's always excitement and fun and adventure in everything we ever do, I believe, including being a prisoner. And, um, but I'm leaving out a lot of stuff in order to save time. Uh, approximately the... Uh, maybe uh, 
And I'll say that maybe the 15th of April, something like that, is when I was captured by the Germans. And uh, after, no, it was early, you know, it was in March. It was in, in late March I was captured by the Germans. And by the 15th, of, now I've got it, by the 15th of April, it was clear, I'm speculating here a bit, it was clear to Rommel that whatever prisoners he had in his bag, uh, he would lose them to the American or the British forces if he did not move them back to the European continent. So all of the prisoners in the little schoolhouse where we were prisoners, uh, all the prisoners were uh, put in a column and marched to the port of uh, Tunis by the Germans under the command of a German uh, non-commissioned officer, probably a sergeant. And uh, I was a senior officer, American officer, in this little outfit. And uh, I marched beside the German sergeant to the port in order that we could go aboard ship, cross the Mediterranean to Italy, and in turn be shipped to Germany. Well, as we got into central Tunis in that little hike, uh, we were bombed by uh, American and or British uh, bombers, I'm not sure which. Uh, they bombed the city of Tunis and our, for our uh, prisoners were endangered and I so told the German sergeant, uh, you cannot do this to us. Under the Geneva Convention you are required to protect us from the bombing and uh, we cannot be safe uh, marching down the streets of this city. He said, I don't know how to do it. He said, what can you do about it? And I said, well, I, I can tell you what to do about it. If we uh, disperse this column, then we'll have no problem with the bombing. He said, you'll have to uh, handle that yourself. And so he designated me to take charge of his prisoners, which was me and the rest of them. And I simply informed the men as we marched through the city uh, that uh, I've been ordered to uh, uh, have you all disperse and I want you to, the minute I give this one word command, I don't want to see you again until we're back in America. And I spoke to 169 men thereafter without further ado and simply said, disperse. And they all obeyed except Lieutenant Ely. I never saw one of them again ever, even to this day of these uh, men of uh, several nationalities, mostly American, but there were other nationalities. And uh, they dispersed and uh, Presumably, uh, some, if not all, got back to the American forces. <coughs> uh, Ailey and I uh, hid ourselves in the rubble in the broken city of Tunis and uh, uh, hid from the German uh, scouts and whatnot who might, might be searching for these prisoners. And uh, we hid there for two or three days, and Ailey and I decided that we couldn't stay there any longer, so we uh, uh, came out of our uh, hideout and uh, walked, just the two of us, uh, through Tunis early one morning, uh, maybe six o'clock in the morning, about first light, and uh, we even saluted German officers, probably from Robel, Rommel's staff, who were uh, in Tunis with their headquarters, marched right past them. We were a grubby-looking pair of fellas. It didn't, they didn't pay any attention to us except to return the salute. We marched out of the town of Tunis uh, some distance. I mean, probably still within the city limits, don't mistake me, but uh, away from the center of Tunis. And lo and behold, an Italian tank, uh, pink in color, probably to, ma to match the desert sand, Italian uh, small tank, light tank, with three or four Italian soldiers on board, stopped us, questioned us in English. We had a little banter back and forth. Uh, they didn't know what we were, but pretty soon they uh, were able to determine that we were Americans, and they put us on their tank, and uh, we were captives again, this time of the Italians. And the, these uh, young Italians who were uh, full of joy and fun and song and whatnot, more than soldiering, uh, by my uh, uh, judgment. Uh, they took us, lo and behold, right back to the schoolyard where we had been prisoners before, and there's Ely and I and the captain of this uh, German prison camp who didn't, all of his prisoners were gone, 
they had we had dispersed them and now here Ely and I are back uh, uh, captured again can you tell us how you quickly now John tell us how you got out away from this German <coughs> this man he uh, told me a couple of hours later he had put me in solitary confinement because he felt that I had committed some kind of offense against the German people. I had stripped off all of my insignia of rank and so forth a couple of weeks ago, and uh, uh, he was surprised to learn that I was a major U.S. Army, and uh, uh, it upset him greatly that uh, when he learned that. So he put me in solitary confinement, and two hours later, he had me called back to his office uh, at which point he turned over command of the uh, prison camp to me and he became my prisoner. And lo and behold, here we are inside Rommel's uh, uh, area and I am in command of a uh, little bit of a prison without a great many prisoners in it, except the Germans are now my prison. I sent Ely up on top of the schoolhouse with some kind of white undershirt or something around his head to represent a flag of truce. I myself went out on the street uh, <coughs> because we were hearing small arms fire, means like machine gun fire and rifle fire. We're hearing that. We guessed it to be a, a friendly fire, that is American or British or maybe French, and went out there uh, to meet these uh, whatever force was coming in. We were aware, of course, that uh, Bradley and uh, uh, so forth, and Alexander and Montgomery and the Second Corps and so forth uh, were uh, on their way to us. And so uh, this is, uh, it was at this time that, the, uh, that I was able to surrender the prison camp to the British leader, British brigade commander, who came in with his tank force and he uh, uh, was able to take charge of us and provide me a jeep or some other transportation, whatever it may have been, for me to return to Second Corps, my real home, where were my good friends, especially the commanding general himself, Omar Bradley. John, that's a very good story, and I know you have another one to tell us today. Beginning, I believe, in July, you participated in, uh, were a part of, helped to plan for the Battle of Sicily. Yes. <clears throat> what from Tunisia, we went back to Oran, where we had earlier entered the continent uh, uh, six months or so before. This now is May of 1943. Went back to Oran for the, Oran for the purpose of refitting the forces uh, and re-equipping them and studying and preparing, them the, preparing the plans for the attack against southern Sicily, the south shore of Sicily. We spent approximately uh, seven weeks, I would say, in preparation. A lot of paperwork going on, assembling uh, all of the supplies uh, required and training the men, getting more troops in, appropriate, arranging the whole amphibious force of hundreds of landing craft and so forth to cross the Mediterranean, gathering all the supplies. I don't want to go into all the detail. There are huge amounts of it. And it's very interesting and it's very important but we simply don't have time we <clears throat> we got this force loaded aboard numerous ships lcis lsts means landing craft infantry landing ship tank so forth all the numerous hundreds of ships for 14 days as we got them loaded 14 days or so in my case uh, we were aboard uh, ship uh, waiting for the landing, just putting the whole thing together. Uh, how come the Germans were not able to destroy that great convoy out in the Mediterranean? I have no answer to today. We have to give a lot of credit to a lot of people, including U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, and, uh, and uh, British counterparts of these, the RAF and so forth. What was D-Day for Sicily? D-Day was July 10 of 1943. Okay. On that day, I was placed on loan to the 45th Infantry Division from General Bradley's II Corps. <clears throat> and I was placed in the 175th, I believe, uh, Infantry. I may not have that number quite correct. And uh, uh, so aboard an LCI, one company of infantry, infantry I went 
uh, across the Mediterranean with them. Again, I was a senior American officer, uh, army officer on this Navy ship, the commanding officer of the ship, a 19-year-old naval ensign was commanding our ship, who was taking us ashore. Think of it, barely out of high school, you might say, and there he's commanding this thing, and successfully, where and proudly. Land? Where did you land, John? We landed in the vicinity of Jela, G-E-L-A, uh, in Sicily on the south shore. And we had about 170 men or so in this company of the 45th Infantry Division from the Oklahoma National Guard. Notice, the 45th Division I've not earlier mentioned today. 45th Division was coming direct from the states. It's Oklahoma National Guard. It was coming from uh, probably New Orleans, I think, and uh, was coming right on over. Its first blooded action would be <coughs> uh, on the beaches of uh, of Sicily, and I suppose I was put with that company to come ashore, possibly because of my previous experience in battle uh, across the uh, Mediterranean in North Africa, but more likely I would think because uh, my uh, senior authorities of the two corps wanted to have the ammunition representative on the ground so that we could be there to do my job after we get there. General Patton had issued a, an order to the entire force the night before, I'd like to quote for you, in which he said, this is the Seventh Army, Seventh United States Army, is being activated and seeing its first action today. Bathed in blood and baptized at sea, I have every confidence in you men. I've always thought that this brief quote from George Patton is certainly a uh, fine kind of recollection of a great soldier. And the, the campaign took, uh, are my notes correct, more than a month? 38 days, you are correct. 38 days. And where were you when the campaign ended? Uh, Probably Caltanisetta. It's about the middle of the island. I think that probably was about our last, my last little headquarters from there. Yeah, the campaign ended, you see, when, uh, when the Italian forces surrendered and the German forces were able to recruit, retreat from Messina, Sicily, across to the toe of yes. Italy. In a sense, the campaign was less than all entirely successful. For full success, we should have captured the whole German force there. We did not succeed in doing that. Uh, whether that means we were uh, considered to be less than a full success, I'll have to leave that to historians. I think we accomplished a great deal. and. Uh, uh, the losses there, although they're always bad, uh, they were not too terrible. I'm not saying that well. Men were killed, and that's terrible. Still in all, today you've told us about two major campaigns, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. Um, my recollection in talking with you before is you were summoned by Omar Bradley to join you in London. Uh, at a date following August 13th. Uh, you went to London, wartime London, for some very important assignments and you met some very important people there. In the time that we have left here, can you give us your impressions of um, hearing for the first time about D-Day, which would come the following June, and about being with men of the caliber of Omar Bradley and Dwight Eisenhower? in wartime London. Can you do that for us in a few minutes here? Please repeat a little bit about just exactly what you want. All right, you were summoned to London by Omar Bradley for uh -huh. an, a very important assignment. It may have been the first time you heard about D-Day. Tell us about being with the very top of the house at this time, of being with people like Omar Bradley and Dwight Eisenhower. <laughs> Well, I can cut that in half because I never had personal dealings, official dealings, with General Eisenhower. 
so I mean, you understand, my commander, Brad Bradley, did have constant. In that sense, I had secondhand dealing with Eisenhower. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. Sir. I never did business with the great and distinguished Dwight Eisenhower. There were plenty of spaces in between me and him. Don't mistake me. There, I have superiors between me and Bradley as well. And, but we knew we were in very important uh, kind of work. That's very true. We had to organize a force and the organization of such you know, I'm, I'm not doing very well I don't believe uh, my aspect of this organization uh, as I have earlier intimated had to do with uh, assembling and making available and, uh, uh, and transporting the bullets uh, where they needed to be when they needed to be and all of this, every aspect of the whole preparation for uh, a major campaign such as the Normandy invasion, every aspect of it has so many different ramific ramifications, national, international, monetary, otherwise, that it's almost beyond description to realize the size of, of, of uh, what these tasks uh, are. And they may seem very mundane compar compared to battle photography, you will see, and so forth. They may seem very mundane, but uh, they are dependent upon a chain of command that uh, works and works well and is endowed with uh, loyalty and spirit and uh, confidence and all of that. Uh, the, the, when you go into some huge thing like Normandy Beach, uh, it probably is, is fair to say that uh, something like uh, 60 percent or more of the troops involved have, this is their first ever action. Think of that. In earlier cases in North Africa, it would have been 100 percent. But even here, it's 60 percent of a million men being inexperienced in battle. So much has to be done, whether the men concerned are chaplains or mess sergeants or ammunition officers or infantry riflemen, all the different kinds of people in this, or the generals who command this. Now, I'm not really grappling with your question, I don't think, John, uh, very well. If you can help me, I may do better. Surely, it's, um, you, your life is leading up to the 6th of June in 1944, yeah. and you had a very important part in all of that. And I think historians would be interested to know um, what were some of the meetings you went to? What did you talk about? What did you hear your generals, your, your commanders talk about? Uh, I would say that young as I was and with such large responsibilities as I had, I did not attend very many of the large gatherings that I think you may have in mind in which the top commanders are deciding just how the battle shall be fought. I was at a lower echelon with my work than that. I got my word from General Bradley's subordinates, whether they would be in anti-aircraft or in field artillery, but the older men than I and more experienced than I, they were able to transmit to me the information which came mm -hmm. from Bradley or Eisenhower or wherever it may have been that provided what I need to have my bullets in the right place there at the right time in the right quantity. I don't mean to be ducking the question, but I didn't plan any battles in the sense of where are we going to attack and will it be the 1st Division or the 4th Division or the 28th Division. I was not in on that kind of thing. That would be in the operations side and I was in the logistics side. The people in that kind of business would tell me what it's going to be and about the only time I could influence that would be, which I guess never happened, I might have been in a position to say, we cannot support that. I never ever made such a statement to anybody like that. I could always support it one way or another. It meant getting trains and trucks and aircraft and people and all the different stuff there to make it happen. And we had a very cooperative kind of uh, organization mm -hmm. among us younger men who other people in other 
kinds of work than munition. This fellow is trucking, this one communication, this one hospital, this one blankets, this one food and whatnot. And we became a kind of a, a, a gopher force, unheard of. None of us was ever famous, and uh, uh, nor will be. And uh, at the same time, uh, we had our counterparts in the lower echelons. I'm speaking now, by this time, General Bradley is commanding 1st United States Army. You understand that. That eventually contained about five corps. And those corps, maybe three or four divisions per each. Now, I didn't deal with every one of those generals, but every one of those generals had uh, uh, assistants who had work related to mine. I dealt with their truckers, I dealt with their own munitions people, and so forth, and we had a very fine relationship and cooperation, and uh, after the infantry won the war, then to some extent we made it possible for them to do. John, on that note, we're going to end this tape, which as you know is the first of four. Um, I think we're leaving you on the eve of one of mankind's great achievements. And you played a very important part about that. And I'm going to say this for whoever is listening to this 50 years from now. Be sure and look at parts two, three, and four because you're dealing with a great man here. Thank you, John. Appreciate it.